We've heard a lot of big ideas today. So I want to conclude with sharing with you a lot of very small ideas. I love this small idea. This was invented by Scott Amron. He's a 31-year-old American electrical engineer, runs a small little company, and he makes products and services that make our lives better. So instead of having to buy a key and a key ring, he made a key ring with the key. You can put all your other keys on there. This is genius. This is small. And that's what I want all of you to do today. I want you to think small. Do me a favor, please. Put your hands out in front of you. Interlock your fingers. Now, whatever thumb you have on top, put the other thumb on top. It's a little uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right. That's what I want to leave you with. Small changes can be impactful. Most of us are familiar with this quote. Rob Waldo Emerson, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. We've all heard this. Read it again. Build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. He didn't say, build a product that's never been invented and you're going to be rich and famous. What he recommends is to take something that already exists and make small changes to it and make it even better. I call this change the difference between evolution and revolution. We talk about the internet revolution and the web 2.0 revolution. What I want to talk to you about is evolutionary change, small changes. Here are a couple of examples. Dasani didn't invent water. They didn't invent bottled water. What they did was they took normal tap water, put it through a double filtration system, puts it in a bottle, and now they sell it to you at more than you pay for the price of a gallon of gasoline. <laughs> Incremental innovation. Panera didn't invent the turkey sandwich, right? But they found a way to make the bread right on site. So when you walk into a Panera and you take that nose hit and you smell that bread, you are willing to pay $8 for a turkey sandwich. <laughs> The Starbucks model for incremental innovation is just a little different. Instead of just trying to decide for themselves what would work best, hmm, they asked their customers. They said, this is a coffee stir. What can we do to make a coffee stir better? Now, I'll give you a hint. The key to incremental innovation is that the new product has to do everything the current product does and something more. Here's what their customers came up with. This stick. It can still stir your coffee. It can do everything the coffee stirrer can do. But also, when you put it in your coffee cup lid, walking at pedestrian speeds of 2 to 3.4 miles per hour, <laughs> your coffee will not spill. Genius! Small. You guys are worrying about your sticks? I want to show you. You're so good with your hands. I saw how well you did the thumb thing. I want you to take your stick. Put it in your hands like this. It's not a magic trick. Put your thumbs together on the bottom. Okay? Then, without letting go, put your thumbs on top. Hold your thumbs at the bottom. Don't let go. And put your thumbs on top. We'll come back. <laughs> this is the first line of my book. Where are the flying cars? I was born in 1961. I know I look much younger. <laughs> I grew up watching the Jetsons, and we were told we were all have flying cars by about the end of last century, right? No more parking problems, no more gas shortages, no more tolls. It was going to be great. We were all going to have a flying car. We know that's not true. What do we have instead? <laughs> the Segway. I don't want to pick on Dean Kamen. He's one of the 100 smartest people on the planet. He's working on a water pump that's going to bring fresh water to people in Africa. It's going to save millions of lives. This was not his finest effort. And you know why? Because he's not like Starbucks. He didn't ask his customers what they want. He went away for seven years, and he said, I'm going to invent a product that will be to the car what the car was to the horse and buggy. I'm going to invent a product that will mean the end of walking. I don't know. I've spent a lot of time in the United States, and I don't look out at Americans and say, you know, the problem with you guys is you just walk too much. Stop all this walking. Let me tell you how great products are made. 
1996, Jeff Hawkins was developing the Palm Pilot, the first PDA, personal digital assistant. This was the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod of its generation, 1996. And while he was developing it, he gave everybody he knew a piece of wood. Everybody he knew, a small piece of wood. Let's say Kelly and I are going to have lunch on Thursday. What do I need to do to import this, input this into my personal digital assistant? I need a calendar, I need some way to write something up. Oh, you guys can tell I'm left-handed. What if you're right-handed? Where do the buttons have to be if somebody's right-handed? My hands are big. Maybe her hands are small. Is it going to be too wide, too thick, too fast? This is the way great products are made. So now, every time I look at a product, this is what I ask myself. Is it a Segway or is it a Palm Pilot? This is a Palm Pilot. You know in the old days you had that bottle of ketchup and you had to stick the knife in there to get the ketchup started and then you had to pound on the bottom to get the ketchup out? So you know what they did? They took the bottle and they turned it upside down and they made it so you could squeeze it. This is brilliant. Incremental innovation, a small change to a bottle of ketchup. This is a segue, guys. <laughs> I, I don't know how many of you have brought your kids to, say, McDonald's and had them say, I am not going to eat french fries unless I can get purple ketchup. I want to show you a video. Microsoft put out a product called the Microsoft Surface. I just want you to watch this video, and while you're watching it, ask yourself, is this a segue or is this a palm pilot? Microsoft Surface represents a new bridge into the digital world. One that lets you shuffle the day's photos like an editor. And then send them through the mail. Surface is a new concierge in the lobby. One who knows all about planning day trips. One who knows every street in town. During the social hour, drinks will arrive at the table and put on a little show. setting the stage for another order of chocolate pie or the decadent cheesecake. When it comes to music, moving through countless playlists and discovering new bands is a hands-on experience. Now everyone is a DJ, and entertainment is king. One day, your computer will be a big-ass table with pictures of other people's kids all over it. Instead of actually playing with your kids, you could just look at video of them playing by themselves. And you'll smile knowing you've only paid $10,000 to do it. And if your mom has $10,000 laying around her house that she has nothing to do with, she can get one too. And then you can send her a postcard for free. That's the power. Of Microsoft Surface. Now consider this. Instead of using one of today's more popular compact devices to get directions to where you're going, why not use a device the size of a small car to do the same job? In the future, getting tanked with your friends is going to be a whole lot more fun because you'll be sitting at a table that makes something cool happen every time they bring you a drink, which you'll want to do over and over. Instead of interacting with actual human beings, you can just order your food right at your table. And remember all that money you spent on iTunes to get your favorite songs? Well, get ready to do it again, but this time for your new table computer. The future is here, and it's not an iPhone. It's a big-ass table. Take that, Apple. Sarcastic Gamer. Com.
Microsoft Surface is a big idea. I want to give you a small idea. I'm a business professor, so I want to give you a business case. We're going to look at the pencil industry. There's a wonderful company named Faber Castell. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. They've been around since 1761. Last year, they almost made two billion pencils. It's the largest pencil manufacturer in the world. The pencil dates back all the way to 1565. A couple of uh, English shepherds were looking around and they found something they decided. They called it black lead. They thought it was better for writing than some of the ink systems they were using. They used it to mark their sheet. The only bad news was it was a little oily, it was a little sticky. So, in 1761, Casper Faber, the founder of Faber Castell, he was a cabinet maker, a craftsman. So he took two pieces of wood and he rounded the edges and he glued a piece of graphite in between the two of them. Now his hands wouldn't get all sticky. This is the first modern pencil. 200 years for the first incremental innovation in a pencil. <coughs> Just a few years later, Faber perfected a new process. He took the graphite, mixed it with clay, heated it up in a kiln, and then he could make these wonderful graphite rods that fit inside what is today the modern pencil. The next piece of innovation, 1822, a couple of Brits invented the first mechanical pencil. Ever sharp, brilliant. This idea, this idea is really small. Instead of making pencils round, the way Faber had always made pencils, they decided to make pencils six-sided so that they wouldn't roll off the table. A wonderful small idea, incremental in innovation. Casper Faber's great-grandson, Lothar Faber, came up with this incredible innovation. 1858 was a big year. H.L. Lippmann said, instead of sharpening a pencil on both ends, as has always been the case, why not put an eraser on one end? And that's the idea that he patented. Faber Castell ignored this patent, started making pencils with erasers. And he sued, H.L. Lippmann sued the Faber Castell. It went all the way to the US Supreme Court, who in 1875 threw out the patent. They said putting an eraser on a pencil is too obvious to patent. It may be too obvious to patent, but it's a great example of incremental innovation. By the way, Vincent van Gogh painted this picture, cleverly named Woman Sewing with a Girl. He painted this in 1883 with one of those Faber Castell pencils and some watercolors, one of those pencils with an eraser. Can you see Vincent van Gogh using an eraser? Not exactly right. Let's make her a redhead. No, that's a bad. Let's make her a blonde. No. Brunette. Yes. Brunette's perfect. The 1900s saw some innovations. They decided to take all the toxins out of the paint and the graphite and the wood and everything else so that kids who chew on pencil wouldn't get sick. Maybe there's a business here for us. What do you think? We could create edible pencils. <laughs> Don't make that face, it's not so bad. If it tastes a little off, we could put some purple ketchup on it. <laughs> this century's also seen several innovations. Now Faber Castell's pencils are in the shape of a triangle, and they put little black sticky dots on it so that it won't slip out of your fingers if you're a child. Here's another innovation. They partnered with Porsche to come up with a pencil that costs $595. You know, when you're thinking about shopping for Christmas, in this day and age of 10% unemployment, nothing says, I feel your pain, like a $600 pencil. <laughs> you think that's an expensive writing device? I'll show you the most expensive writing device ever made. In 1967, NASA put out a requirement. They needed a space pen. They needed a pen that would work at minus 50 degrees centigrade, plus 400 degrees centigrade, and would work in a gravity-free vacuum. Who the hell is writing when it's 400 degrees anyway, right? <laughs> Some astronaut up in space, uh, dear mom, I know you're worried about global warming, but trust me, up here it's a lot worse. <laughs> this was during the space race. The Soviets were also trying to come up with the latest and greatest technology, but they didn't have the $2 million that the Fisher Space Pen Company devoted to this product. But they needed a product that would meet all of the exact same specifications. Thank goodness they found a technology. It's called a pencil! <laughs> Ted celebrates big ideas, and the one point I want to leave you with is a lot of small ideas are often more valuable than one big one. Thank you very much.